Good day, everyone. Um, thanks, Desiree. So um, you can see Desiree's names up on on the presentation because she she jumped ship on us before um, be, be, well before we we had this one. Um, the previous dates, uh, Desiree would have been up here presenting as well. So um, just like to to say thanks for for your work that you've done on the project over the last few years because it's been great. So um, what we're talking about today is some um, crazy ants. What I'll do is I'll do a bit of a run through um, some of the, the the problems with crazy ants, why we're doing what we do, uh, and look at some of the, the things that we've done with the cane industry. Then I'll hand over to Jazz to um, to run through the products that we've been making. Um, Jasmine drives a lot of the mapping that we do for the industry, and um, and she's far better to, to speak to those particular items. I'm more of a generic big picture sort of person. So um, look, Crazy Ants turned up in Cairns in 2001. I, th I think a lot of you already know this, but I see a new few faces that I don't know. Um, by 2012, they had uh, turned up in the wet tropics world heritage area. Um, that's the point where our organisation, Wet Tropics Management Authority, started jumping up and down saying, well, we need to do something about this. Um, they're really destructive when they get going. And, um, yeah, they're one of the top 100 invasive species in the world. They also do a lot of damage uh, in agricultural systems. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit in a, middle, in a minute. So the current eradication program uh, started in 2013 and it's been running in its current form uh, since about 2017 when we got some significant funding to, to take this pest on. So they are an absolute threat to the World Heritage Area. It's why we're in it. They affect both flora and fauna. Um, they'll directly predate on, on you know, frogs, lizards, invertebrates, all of that, they'll impact uh, birds. You know, if you've got ants up in the canopy of the rainforest, the birds will land, the ants will crawl on them, off they go. When you see a, a major infestation of these things, it's absolutely horrific. The, the sound in the rainforest that you normally associate of birds and insects and all that, it's gone. All you hear is the wind in the trees. So um, they're, they're a major impact like that, but they also have secondary impacts. Like a lot of ants, these guys... Um, farm sap-sucking insects and scale insects. And what that leads to is damage to uh, trees. You get sugars forming on the leaves. That encourages the growth of sooty moulds, inhibits uh, photosynthesis, and then you get tree death. And we've seen that happening in places like Christmas Island. Uh, we've been lucky here. We haven't seen that occurring in our locality, but that's mainly because we've got on top of the, what's going on. So there's a lot of challenges with what we do. We're working with about 2,100 hectares and it covers a, a large number of tenures. We've got you know, massive areas that we're working with. And invasive species, they don't care about all our imaginary lines. Every one of you know what I mean when I talk about imaginary lines. You all deal with cadastral data and things like that. Some of those lines are real, fences, things like that, but ants don't care. Unfortunately, we have to work with that, those systems. We have to respect land boundaries. We have to respect all of those other things. We have to try and get access to all these different properties. So it's a, it's a really big challenge for us to get that sort of stuff through. So one of the big things with crazy ants and where they're at, 34% of the infestation that we're dealing with is in sugarcane. It's the single largest uh, landscape type that we're dealing with. Only 6% of what we're dealing with is in the World Heritage Area. And we can get the ants out of the World Heritage Area really quite easily. Uh, it's taken a few years, but they're out of almost all of the World Heritage Area now. But if we don't push them out of all those other areas, um, they can just come back in. So we need to target them on the ground where they're at and, and actually get them out of the, world, out of the, the surrounding areas. And so in that sugarcane, we are presented with some really interesting challenges. Sugarcane farming absolutely moves these things around. They nest in around the bases of the stools, 
And so when you get harvesting coming through, they'll pick up ants, they'll pick up a whole colony, and they can move them and drag them down the paddock, or they can put them into the, into the rakes, and we've ended up with uh, crazy ants turning up down at uh, Mulgrave Mill. So there's no question that these things get moved around in the cane industry. Um, not so much in the planting, but that can happen as well, because they'll harvest um, some cane out of an infested area, move that to a new area, plant it out, and bang, they've moved them. But it's mainly in the harvest activities. Harvesting cane can be really unpredictable if you don't know your way around the industry. It's, um, when I first started with it, I just, I could not see any logic behind the way harvesting worked. You know, they, they come into a farm, they'll take out a few rows, then they'll go to the next farm over there and then over here. What it is, is they're keeping uh, sugar content across the farms fairly equitable. Because if you harvest one far farm at the start of the season, another har farm at the end of the season, they may have very different sugar contents. And so it gets the crop off in an equitable way. It makes it really, really hard for us to work though, because we've got to try and get out in the field and survey. You've got big trucks moving around and that sort of stuff. It's very, very dangerous. So we had to learn a lot about the cane industry um, to be able to effectively work with them. And part of that is really getting on the front foot. The most important thing we did was to get a relationship happening with the industry that is, is both of us working in partnership. And the bloke on the bottom there, Wes Moller. Uh, Wes is our industry uh, liaison officer. And Matt Hessian from Mulgrave Mill, those of you who work in the NRM fields up in Cairns will most likely have come across Matt in your travels. Um, the two of them together have been a real powerful force in getting the work that we do and getting the industry linked together and it's that's really what is important here is that relationship um, we've managed to get a lot of trust built up between a government organization and then an industry now, Desiree over there was fundamental in this as well um, in 2020 we finally managed to establish a data sharing agreement with Mulgrave Mill and that is really, really important and it's really, really valuable, but it came with a lot of caveats and a lot of things we had to work through. Mulgrave Mill collects a huge amount of data when they work in cane. They are tracking all those um, harvesters, they're tracking the trucks, they're tracking the cane trains. All of that is all collected into, into a nice, comfortable GIS system um, and it's for their use what we managed to do is uh, build up enough trust, and it is about trust, to be able to get them to provide us with that data that they collect. They collect it for, for monitoring what's coming out and, and making sure that yields are, are tracked and all of that sort of stuff. But there's a huge amount of that data that is really, really apl applicable to the work that we're doing. Um, and what we can do with that data is actually build products for growers to help them manage risk on their farms. When you've got crazy ants in one corner of a paddock, you don't want them in, across the whole paddock. So working with them to be able to get that sort of thing under control and manage their risk has been very, very important. Contact, for contact details. Contact details are really important. Before we go onto a farm, we need to let farmers know we're going to be there. We don't know what activities they've got going on. It could be a risk to our staff. So we've got contact details for every farm. That's really important and it changes every year. A lot of cane farms are leased and they'll grow, you know, a crop through several years but then the next time you go back the year later it'll be like, oh, someone else is in charge of this block of land. So we, it's really important that we have that access. Um, they give us cane siding data. So cane trains will sit up and park in certain areas while they, they finish filling up all the bins. So we need to go in, pick those up for surveys and that sort of stuff. Uh, we look at things like how, how many, the ratoon status. So when you plant cane, the first crop that you grow out of it is called planter cane. Subsequent crops from that, you just cut off the, the cane and it regrows. That's called a return. And that disturbance that you get when you 
plough up a, a paddock to plant, is, it has a big impact on the grazing ants. But when you leave it and grow return crops, there's no disturbance happening, so the ants are not, um, you know, they don't, not killed by ploughing activities and things like that. So there's a higher risk of them being able to establish and stay in the paddock longer. So the first thing we did, we, uh, we sort of worked with the cane industry, we consulted with the growers, with the harvesters, with the mill, and came up with some basic protocols about keeping their machinery clean. And that's where the GIS starts to come into this and where I'm going to hand over to Jasmine. Um, because it's all good to try and clean down a harvester, but the fact is that when they harvest, there's a lot of material gets built up in the harvester, it gets in under the chassis. Um, if you've ever looked closely at a harvester while they're working, it's a, it's a mess. There's a lot of material caught up there. And they can't just pull it all out and hose it down with a gurney. That's just not a practical option. What we need to do is, is work with them and provide a way that they can still go about their work efficiently, but minimise that risk of dragging all that trash around, which is where the ants are spread from. So I'll hand over to Jazz, and Jazz will talk you through the products that we've made in conjunction with the mill and for farmers and for industry to, to help us with managing those risks. Thanks, Gareth. Um, this is the first time I've spoken out of the program, so I'm a little bit shy and I'm going to read a lot. <laughs> um, the role of GIS in this part of the program is mostly to incorporate the data we got from the sugar meal and the data that we also collect in the field and run it through various analysis, analysis to actually simplify it and present it in a way that can be easily interpreted and, and utilised. Um, sometimes there's so much background that goes in to produce a very simple looking map. The first map I'd like to show is a great example of how we collaborate with the sugarcane industry using GIS. This is our traffic light system protocols. It was developed to help manage cane harvester movement in and out of YCA infestations. Red is the buffered yellow crazy ant areas. Amber is the paddocks that go into these areas, and green marks the paddocks that have no YCA. Harvesters are required to wash down if they go from a red and amber paddock into a green paddock. The idea is to help farmers from spreading yellow crazy ants in a way that is feasible on the ground. Um, we send this shape file off to Matt and he makes individual farm level maps for each of the relevant farmers before the sugar cane harvest season starts. The cane farmers can then use this to organise their harvesting. For example, they can harvest the green paddocks first and then go into the red or amber paddocks last to minimise the need for washing down. Um, this map is um, more than just dumping the data into the analysis, but it's essential to apply the knowledge and experience from the rest of the team, where's Gareth and operations, to look at each site specifically each year and as well as to build the baseline rule sets. This teamwork is necessary for all the GIS work that we do. After the cane season, we create monitoring maps to visualise how the harvesters moved in and out of the red and amber paddocks. Wes takes these maps out when he meets up with the sugar cane farmers at the end of the harvest season. For example, on the bright blue day, the cane harvester went from a non-infested area first into the infested area. But on the previous purple day, the harvester went from an infested area into a non-infested area. So the harvester would have had to wash down between those two paddocks. The purpose of these maps is to follow up with the traffic light system with the farmers to look at the cane harvester movements together and if any concerns do arise, we can range follow-up surveys. It's about mitigating risk but also about fostering good relations. We understand that the traffic light system isn't perfect and sometimes cannot be followed 100% logistically on the ground. A map that is similar to the monitoring map is our cane harvester tracing maps that we, that we create when we find a new infestation in cane. These are more detailed 
harvester trace forward and trace back maps that we do from 2016 all the way through to the current year to identify any paddocks that we need to survey to check for yellow crazy ants, but also for insights on potential sources of the infestation. When we find a new infestation in cane, we send a map, a map off to Matt, we inform the farmer and we add it into the traffic light system. Um, so in this map, we are tracing that site there, which we found in 2020. And we're tracing the harvester movement in 2017 coming from in, going into that site and coming out of that site. Um, the orange dots that you can see are the presences from 2017. So as you can see, there was movement from yellow crazy ant infested areas into the new site that we found a couple of years later. One of the major focuses for the program in the last couple of years has been finding any remaining undetected YCA infestations. This is essential if we're to achieve eradication in the hoped time span. In Kane, this meant developing a system to help identify high-risk paddocks for survey priorities. So we decided to look at the potential spread via cane harvesters for the years 2016, 2017 and 2018. We chose these years because they were before the traffic light system and we also had very high densities of, of yellow crazy ants in, in cane at that time. We prioritised these years further by looking at frequency, that's the number of times each paddock had been potentially spread to and we also looked at the return. Category 1, for example, in this map is the highest priority because it has been potentially spread to over all three years and has a return greater than three, so three years since it, a major disturbance. We use this mapping in conjunction with other information such as survey history or survey gaps, um, proximity to or downstream from other infestations, the month harvested, as well as other logistical considerations to target and prioritise our high-risk cane surveys. Um, for example, month harvest is important operationally because we need to survey the cane after it's reached a certain height. As yellow crazy ants, detectability is related to temperature and sun exposure. The end product is a high-risk cane polys with, with harvest information and contact information attached so the film teams can select their polys, download them to their GPS and head out and survey them. Here is a map of the surveys we conducted in the cane inside and outside of our treatment areas this year. As well as looking at high risk cane product paddocks, we also looked at parts of the cane railway, the railway sidings, particularly coming from our infestations down to the mill headlands and creeks downstream from cane infestations. Last year, we looked at the edges where the cane meets the forest, so all the way from up near Edmonton all the way down to Deerill. The squares, the blue squares that you can see, they were the headland surveys. For these, we took it a step further and we used potential spread mapping for all five years through to 2020, plus some potential source mapping, as well as looking at farms which are owned by the same farmers to pinpoint which headlands to survey. This cane survey season we surveyed over 2,000 hectares of cane. And so these are some of the mapping and tools we've created so far from the, da the data management sharing agreement. And I'll pass it back to Gareth to talk to you about some of the outcomes. Thanks, Jess. You did good. All right. Um, so there's a huge amount of work that goes into to what look like fairly simple maps in, as, as Jay said, um, there's a, an awful lot of interpretation that has to go on. It's not just mapping pure data, unfortunately. We need to actually understand the, the landscape that we're working in when we do this. Um, but the great thing is that when, we, when it all comes down to it, over the last 12 months, we picked up eight new infestations and six of those infestations came directly from these, these products that we're making. And that's a huge thing. What it means is that we are actually able to 
focus our efforts onto those really high risk areas. We've got a huge amount of land to cover when you, you think about the movement of materials, vehicles, et cetera, between cane farms um, throughout the district. Uh, it's, it's a really complex place. And so building these tools that allow us to, to focus our efforts uh, is really, really valuable. We've only got uh, limited resources like everyone else. We've got about 30 to, to 50 people on the ground in any given survey season, which is a, it sounds like a lot, but what you've got to remember is they're undertaking surveys at a five by five metre resolution in, in sugarcane. So they're actually walking along making a five by five grid and physically inspecting points all the way. We did around about a million points this year. So being able to target that work is so important. Um, The other thing that we've been able to do out of that, when we start to see these places turn up, we then get clues. So when we're in cane farms, we can then start following watersheds and stuff like that. We've picked up a couple of infestations through that process as well. And um, the the whole benefit of the, of the thing together is really important for the cane industry because it's protecting their industry, it's protecting their businesses. And... Um, particularly with these farmers down in that Gordon Vale, Edmonton area, they're now acutely aware of the risk. They're all working together to minimise, um, you know, if, if they hear that a, far, that a harvester's been working on an infested property, they make sure that he's clean before he comes. Um, it's, it's really important because they know the amount of work that's going to have to go into cleaning their paddocks up and it is an important thing for them to do. So thank you so much for your time this morning. And... Uh, more than happy to take any questions. Uh, we use uh, a fipronil bait, so it's a it's a um, fish meal substrate, and fipronil is the active ingredient, but it's very very low low dose, zero point zero one grams per kilo, five kilos per hectare, and um, to put that in perspective. The normal dose that you would use of the same chemical for, say, uh, cutworms or something like that is six grams per litre as a spray. It's really, um, we're talking really small doses. And the reason for that is we need the ants to pick it up and take it back to the nest and feed the queens. If we kill them out in the field where they're all foraging, the queens are still back at home producing more, ant more, more ants. So. Red fire ants, yep. Yep. We largely use... It depends on, the on obviously, the area. Helicopter is the main one. Um, and then by hand, when we get to sensitive areas, like around waterways and things like that, where we need to be very, very detailed, we have done previous inquiries around drones, and I'm more than interested in having a yarn with you later because... Um, you know, when we first started inquiring, we were talking about one kilo payloads and things like that. And the, the price of running a drone at that time was just astronomical. You know, a helicopter comes down to, to less than $50 a hectare. So, um, but we have some areas outside of this, you know, we've got um, quarries and stuff like that where access is a genuine safety issue. And um, as we're reducing ant populations down and they're becoming clustered, it's re actually becoming more important to look at other technologies like drone application for sure. No, but it's a really good thing, and I will mention that to Matt, actually, because it's it's worth following up on, for sure. And just on that, the clean-down method, is that like a weed seed style? Um, yeah, yeah. So what we, what we get them to do when they're coming out of an area, um, along with physical removal of trash and, you know, 
most of them will carry a, a, a blower rather than being able to hose down. But um, then we get them to actually spray their, their harvesters and, and machinery down with, with a, just a, a normal knockdown insecticide. And that's, we've, we've seen it reduce. It, it doesn't completely get rid of that risk, but it reduces the risk significantly. Yeah, um, so out of, the, out of the current area, we're dealing with about 2,100 hectares. We're down to only treating 25% of that. Um, most of the areas that we're dealing with now, uh, we have in long-term monitoring and spot treatment. So you'll typically find, a, out of what was a 400 hectare infestation, you may only find two or three hectares that have got ants left on it. As we're more successful in wiping them out, they reduce down into little clusters here, there and everywhere. And we knock them back, knock them back, knock them back until, bang, they're gone. Uh, surveying is ongoing. You need, you know, four to, to six years of surveys to be able to have the confidence to say these things are gone. You're talking about an animal that's only three and a half, four, four millimetres long. And subsequently, um, it really is needle in haystack stuff. It's why we use uh, canine detection and stuff like that to, to try and improve our, our work. But the, the bottom line is lots of surveys over a long period of time is the only way to truly build your level of confidence in eradication.